Hello, everyone. Welcome to Life Science Across the Globe. I'm Janine Stevens, one of the Janelia organizers of this series. And on behalf of all eight sister institutes, I welcome you to today's event on machine learning approaches in the life sciences, hosted by the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology. Please visit Life Science Across the Globe to see, uh, .org to see our full lineup of monthly events, to subscribe to our calendar, and to view recordings of all of our past events. Um, we would also love to hear your input on a brief survey that we'll post in the chat box at the end of today's session, so please stay tuned for that. Um, uh, during the Q&A, please go ahead and write your questions in the Q&A box at any time, and our moderator will ask them during the Q&A period. Um, as a reminder, trainees, you're invited to stay on the call after the main event today for a special Meet the Panelist session. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Shores Shares, group leader at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, who's moderating today's session. Shores. Hey, everyone. Uh, greetings from the MRC Lab of Molecular Biology in uh, Cambridge, UK. And thank you very much for joining us today on what I hope will be an exciting session on how machine learning is contributing to the uh, life sciences. If you've uh, joined us today, I think it's likely you're interested in the molecular and cellular processes that, that, that may sustain life. And very likely you're also interested in how these processes go wrong or what happens when, uh, when disease happens. And ultimately then how we could intervene and, and provide with uh, therapies for, uh, for uh, curing disease. So the, talks, the three talks we've lined up today explore this and explore how computers could help us um, in, in making this process better. So we'll go from, from molecular uh, structures of, of proteins through to the design of new therapeutic compounds and then even the development of such compounds in, in the clinic and, and how they can help to, uh, to cure disease. So we'll, uh, we'll follow the, um, the talk and by, by a discussion about some of the important new questions that these new technologies will raise uh, in our field. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, the first speaker who is uh, John Jumper. John Jumper is a senior research uh, scientist at the uh, Google DeepMind team in uh, London, UK. And uh, he was a uh, lead of the uh, AlphaFold team on protein structure de uh, design. John, the floor is all yours. Thank you. And you should be able to see my slides now. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, AlphaFold really um, in two contexts. One, I think, is an example of how our scientific knowledge can really inform how we build machine learning systems and how do we bring the important experimental and theoretical work of science back into our machine learning. And then I think also as an example of how it's being used and the impact it's having on the community and maybe how we might think about these types of uh, problems going forward. And so I'll go ahead and get started. And AlphaFold that you've probably heard of is in a sense, a, a simple system. And if you, if you think of it like a mathematician, you might say it's a really, really simple system. It's something that takes uh, what is very accessible on the left, protein sequences, and through a big fat complex arrow produces on the right predictions of protein structure, sometimes and often highly accurate predictions on which uh, you can build your experiments and, and base some of your understanding of the system. And this is really nice, it's really clean as a problem and it's also really, really important. But what goes in the middle is really challenging. And we've known for a long time, and we've known since Anfinsen that such a thing should exist, that the sequence should uh, determine the structure, of course, up to exceptions. But how exactly we do this and how we handle the complexity of biology and of experimental conditions and every, everything else in getting between the left and right hand sides has been a grand challenge for a long time. And so, of course, if we're talking about machine learning, we should start by talking about data and we should talk about it in two contexts. And of course, this is the incredible work and the incredible foresight of the Protein Data Bank, which is now about 50 years old, recently celebrated its 50th anniversary. And as you probably know, protein structures are extraordinarily difficult uh, to determine experimentally. Uh, we know less than 200,000 deposited in the main database, but very excitingly and very importantly that this is an incredibly diverse set that the protein data bank represents the output of the experimental community thanks to the effort of the community to really say that to publish a structure you must deposit it here 
And so it contains this incredible diversity and is also the basis of being able to do evaluation. That uh, when you talk about machine learning and really, really good machine learning must come with really, really great evaluation and understanding of it. And this was enabled by the Protein Data Bank and by the CASP community to do blind assessments to really understand what works and what doesn't work. And this is really the key ingredient of even having a machine learning problem in the first place. You must define what you want to produce and how you're gonna figure out if you've produced it. Now with that, and I can show you a picture of the AlphaFold high level diagram and it's already extremely complex. And if you're, if you're not in the field, you shouldn't think of it this way. You shouldn't think about all these individual blocks and connections and their meaning exactly you should really kind of step back and think about some of the principles of how we want to understand structure. And so the first principle, and this is um, certainly older than the AlphaFold work and a lot of uh, great work over many labs over the years, is, well, let's not think about the Enfinson problem exactly. Let's not talk about how the sequence determines the structure of the energy landscape via really physical things, let's also say, well, the structure has a very strong influence on the evolution of the protein. Structure is conserved over long time scales. And so there's been the field of evolutionary structure prediction, including coevolution, where we try and understand the structure from its effect on evolution and try and find the structure based on saying, here are many, many homologs that uh, share strong structural similarity. And this is a much more rich and powerful information source. And that's one strand that came in, but we've had these types of um, ideas for some time and they've made a lot of progress, but there, there was still quite a bit missing. And part of what was missing is ability to handle the complexity. And there's been this enormous story that surely you haven't missed of machine learning. That's probably why you're here. And I, one way that I like to think about machine learning is it's given us these incredible gadgets and blocks and pieces of understanding data of making really, really complex functions and you know, attention is the most common now, there are many others. And these blocks are incredibly powerful. They work in speech and language and understanding uh, cat videos. They're so generic that they know nothing about proteins, that, they're, that they'll require the data to tell them everything about proteins, but we only have about 200,000 protein structures. So in a sense, we want a place to insert our kind of understanding and creativity into this. And so really, as we built uh, AlphaFold 2, what we were really thinking about, and this is a huge departure from AlphaFold 1, where we had a very off the shelf machine learning system together with a complex uh, system that tried to insert the science around it. We tried to put our understanding of physical, and ge physical insights or geometric insights into the machine learning. And as an example of how we did this, and this is one of the main blocks in the system, really said, okay, well, how should you think about residue pairs, the kind of pairwise interactions or core to physics? How should we think about evolution and multiple sequence alignments is how we um, start, is our starting place for understanding evolution. And then how do we kind of make those pieces of data interact in appropriate ways. And here we're taking the gadgets like attention and adapting them to say, okay, well, if you're doing, for example, attention, if you're trying to find relationships in the MSA, well, what you currently understand about the pairwise structure, what are contacts, et cetera, should really inform that. And so when we process the MSA, we modulate that processing by our understanding of the structure. Now, having developed possibly an updated understanding of the MSA, of the multi-sequence alignment, the evolution, well, we can now try and insert that information in the structure in this alternating way. And what we do is we build this basic block that we call EvoFormer that has these kind of semantic operations between evolution and geometry or physics and alternates them. We don't really say what the network should do, but we build, um, because it can learn that from the data, it will learn that in the attempt to produce PDB structures. But what we are doing is really saying, this is the ways you should communicate. It's kind of like um, being a good manager. You don't always tell people what to do. Sometimes you simply tell them that they should go talk to someone else. And so when we built this, and I won't go into the details since this is a short talk, but as we did more and more things to align um, how we built our neural networks with what we understood about the protein problem, we saw dramatically increased efficiency and accuracy in predicting the answer. And in a sense, if we had a PDB that was 100 times as big, I'm quite sure we wouldn't have to do any of this, that it would, uh, that it would learn structure pretty directly. But at the size of experimental data we have, 
really have to build some of our understanding and cleverness into the machine learning system. And this this large trade this trade off between using lots of data when you have it, or using lots of your own human intelligence when you have less data. And it's a continuing trade off within the machine learning field. Now. We built a system and predict structures. I haven't gone into many details, but the most important thing I've left off is, as you know, it doesn't always give the right answer. There may not always even be one answer. How do we understand the confidence? And especially as we're saying that experimental biologists should go do a different experiment because the alpha fold prediction uh, explains some fact about their protein. What is that reliable? And in what cases are that reliable? And what about the prediction is reliable? And so we put a lot of effort into building uh, two different types of confidence measures. And I don't, you shouldn't think of an alpha fold prediction as strictly right or strictly wrong. You, like all models, it kind of induces some hypotheses about the world. And sometimes the model is saying, I believe these are trustworthy hypotheses and sometimes I believe they're not. And so like the simplest and most direct and you'll almost always see predicted structures colored according to some measure of confidence we use PLDDT, because LDDT is a well-established measure of local structural uh, quality um, developed externally. So PLDDT is the prediction of LDDT. And what we find is this is a really, really convenient way to get a kind of top level understanding of these are trustworthy or untrustworthy areas. So blue, uh, the dark blue is the kind of confidences where we expect even the side chains to often be correct. The light blue is we expect the cartoon to look right and the side chains to look wrong. Uh, yellow is a really unfortunate thing where we probably aren't right, we're not sure. And then interestingly, the lowest confidence of this measure is quite commonly associated with disorder. And we see and low confidence and especially some smooth versions of it are extremely strong predictors of disorder that are almost certainly more accurate than IOPRED and competitive with um, uh, special purpose disorder predictors. And so what we're really saying is, and it's kind of obvious when you think about it, that the disordered regions must be low confidence because the network hasn't found anything because there's nothing to find in terms of structure. But it is really important to emphasize, and this is part of like correctness isn't just one thing. An individual atom is not correct. It's correct in relation to others. That we have an example on the right, which a lot of light blue, right? We think the backbone is correct, but you can kind of tell if you're familiar with any of these class of proteins, that doesn't look like a very plausible uh, overall domain packing for this. And so even though all of those domains are thought to be correct, it's almost certainly not the correct relationship of them. And very likely this particular protein is flexible. And these kind of considerations uh, led us to develop a second confidence measure that I think is much more powerful. And I should say, if you're using alpha fold structures and interpreting them, simply never interpret them without looking at the PAE or predicted aligned error. And here, this is a pairwise uh, measure that is roughly uh, for a given ij pixel is residue j in a correct relationship to residue i. And what's really, really interesting about this is within a domain, normally this will be dark, meaning high confidence. Everyone will be confident relative to each other. But for inner domain interactions, you see quite a bit of difference. And in the example, like we had on the previous slide, you can see that almost none of the domains are thought to be in correct alignment relative to each other, which is true. This is certainly not a correct domain packing and there may not exist a domain packing, but you can often find interesting and predicted interactions. And so there's actually been some really great work. I should have updated the slides for it from the Marcotte lab showing, for example, that the PAE confidence is an extremely good predictor of chemical cross-linking concordance. So high PAE indicates that uh, there will be a high percentage of say cross-linking violations and low PAE has almost no uh, chemical cross-linking violations. So this is a really important measure in how you think about this. And in all these cases, when you're doing machine learning, the model is making a prediction. If you're lucky or if, the, if it's designed well, you'll have an idea of confidence of that prediction but it's also kind of incumbent on you of even within that prediction, when you're predicting really complex objects like a protein structure, that different relationships will be confident or non-confident. And so it's something that needs to be handled with care as we build these into larger systems or build biological understanding. Now, the other kind of interesting question is, well, what about the fact that Anfinsen is an ill-defined problem? What is the structure of the sequence? Is it exactly correct? We don't know what about post-translational modifications, APO versus HOLO, oligomer state, everything else. And it's worth saying AlphaFold does not produce APO structures. That's a misunderstanding of the task it was given. 
the task it was given, it said, here is a sequence. The sequence has been deposited within some PDB structure. It could be an enormous cryo-EM structure in which this is a small percentage of the overall structure. This could be an NMR structure. This could be many, many other things. And AlphaFold is always trying to predict how it would appear in PDB. So if this is a heme binding protein, even though AlphaFold can't produce hemes, can't, wasn't told there was a heme, it will leave heme-shaped holes or very similarly for metal binding sites. Even interestingly for homomers, it often does a very good job. So you see the prediction in the middle, the T1080, the CASP target ID. Uh, AlphaFold actually, we predicted one of those chains and it was able to produce the intertwined structure that when aligned to the, when three copies are aligned, you can see it's clearly an intertwined trimer. And so we found actually AlphaFold is highly accurate at producing homomer structures even in isolation. Now there's work to understand because it doesn't tell you if they are homomers. This doesn't work as well, for example, like on the right where heterotypic interactions stabilize the green chain. And here we can't really predict that. Although I will say, and I won't talk about it as much in this talk for time, we've developed um, a system alpha-fold multimer that you can also freely use that uh, predicts protein-protein interactions um, often quite accurately. And so if you have a system that is really stabilized by heterotypic contacts, it, you really, really need to tell it the heterotypic partners and use the multimer system to build it. But all of this is kind of saying, be really, really careful when you think about these machine learning systems, think about what they're trying to do in the sense of how were they trained, and then also think about how you're using or understanding them. Don't, you know, things missing aren't necessarily not part of the prediction in a certain sense. In some ways they are inferred. And it, it's complex and it's still, I think, an evolving area of how we understand these. But it has been used really effectively. A couple uh, pieces of work from external labs, both understanding the context in which, for example, post-translational modifications occur. And then also some interesting work that says, well, actually, if AlphaFold leaves, say, a glycan-shaped hole in a protein in a, in a known glycosylation site, then we can just build that in. And then there's been external work, AlphaFill and others, on how do we build, um, how do we kind of complete these structures or add the implied context uh, back into these structures. And this is something where I think it will evolve rapidly over the next few years in terms of our ability to predict these directly as opposed to working afterwards. But all of this can be done. I think there's going to be a lot of really great work in how do we understand cellular context from the predicted protein structures. There's also been, I think, some of the most exciting work using AlphaFold has been in structure determination itself. So within the crystallography community, it is very, very heavily used um, uh, for phasing. And then within the cryo-EM community, AlphaFold has kind of an NMR-like behavior where it's often locally correct, or it's finding local interactions and the global structure arises from local interactions, as opposed to crystallography or cryo-EM, where the local structure is extracted by the superposition of many particles. So blurry or lower resolution, for example, cryo-EM, which is, or cryo-ET, like the enormous nuclear pore complex, really benefits because it both validates AlphaFold models and then AlphaFold is providing atomic detail. And so there's been some really exciting work in integrative structure determination um, in bringing together this kind of the resolution revolution, especially the mid range of that, together with uh, atomic details from predicted structures. And so this is a rapidly evolving area. And I think kind of stepping back, like this is the AlphaFold story, but I think, I hope that in 10 years, AlphaFold will be seen as kind of the, the moment that opened the floodgates of machine learning, really changing how we think about structural biology and larger biological questions. And I like to think of structure prediction and machine learning in general as, a, as an amplifier for the incredible work of the experimental community. And so it's an opportunity to take kind of sparse experimental data and complete the picture. And so I, th I think what will be really exciting in the in the coming years is how do we start designing experiments in order to train machine learning models? We're already seeing that uh, with multiplexed uh, assays. And then how do we really start to think about this interchange between experiment and machine learning? And then how do we use the machine learning and when is it reliable? And I think this will drive a lot of exciting progress because biology is enormous and enormously complex. And I think we finally have the kind of mathematical and computational tools to meet that complexity head on, but it's still a lot of difficult and exciting work to come. And with that, I want to uh, thank the many, many people that uh, made AlphaFold possible, incredible uh, 
team at DeepMind that worked on both the methods and our release of the human proteome in the larger AlphaFold database, which I actually didn't talk about today, but I assume many, many of you have used, and uh, want to very much call out our collaboration with Imbol to make these predictions available. And they've been incredible partners in how we build this, how we explain these results to experimentalists, and how do we make sure that we're really being responsible. We feel, you know, this enormous weight of we want to save experimentalist time and not lead them down blind alleys. And I think it's been really, really exciting to see what people have built on top of that work. And uh, with that, I want to say thank you to everyone and especially the organizers. Thanks a lot, uh, John. That was brilliant. Um, second, we have uh, Gisbert Schneider, who's uh, director at the ETH uh, Center in Singapore. Good evening, uh, Gisbert. Thank you for uh, joining uh, so late. And we look forward to your contribution on how uh, AI is contributing to uh, drug design. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Greetings from Singapore. My part of today's uh, seminar deals with the small molecules. We've heard about alpha fold and how to predict protein structures. And I will talk about how we can find ligands that might bind to uh, these protein structures by using generative machine intelligence. Now, but before I start uh, with talking about today's advances, let me dial back in time a little bit. Um, here is a, a citation uh, by um, Voltaire, the famous uh, French philosopher. Doctors pour drugs of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less, into human beings of whom they know nothing. This slightly cynical remark um, points to a fundamental issue we're facing when interacting with adaptive living systems like the human organism. We find uh, ourselves what I call at the edge of chaos. And chaos is characterized by three main ingredients, three properties, error, non-linearity, and incompleteness. We're facing error of models, our understanding. We, we just learned about uh, errors in, in protein structures, for example, but also errors in data and vari variability, errors of measurement, for example. Then we have to face the, the issue of nonlinearity, um, drug action. One drug may work in one individual, but it doesn't in the other. We're also having the issue of non-additivity, meaning uh, that just by adding one functional group to a small molecular structure doesn't always lead to the same outcome. And finally, of course, I think you all agree that we have to concede our incomplete understanding of the molecular pathology. Taking together these fundamental challenges we are having when it comes to developing new medicines leads to partial predictability partial predictability. We can only predict so far, but some of these uh, big challenges will remain um, uh, will remain to be solved in the future. Now, AI to the rescue. We're in the era of AI and uh, David Gunkel uh, stated that we're now at a point where we have AI systems that are not directly programmed. They develop their own decision patterns. And over the past actually 30 years, um, I and my team have been uh, exploring the question to which degree can machine learning systems, can an AI be creative? And we have we've applied these tools together with many other researchers uh, around the globe um, to generating small molecules that have a predicted bioactivity and drug-like properties. And uh, those of you who follow um, the world of AI more closely may have seen uh, this artwork uh, in, in even in New York Times um, featured, the Théâtre d'Opéra Spatial. Um, it is an artwork uh, made with, by AI actually, um, by uh, the artist Jason Allen. And um, there is an ongoing uh, discussion in the uh, community, whether this could be considered a creative uh, work or whether it is merely repetitive because it was generated uh, with AI, in this case, Midjourney software. Now, but back to the small molecules. 
we want to design molecules de novo from scratch and we're using feedback learning. This is the age old um, cycle of deduction and induction. We start with a hypothesis uh, and then go in, in the case of, of molecules to synthesis. So they have to be uh, produced somehow in the laboratory. Then we test them in biological assays. And finally, feed the result of these assays back to some kind of intelligent uh, decision-making system so that we can learn and update our hypothesis. And hypothesis in this case means a small molecular structure. AI now allows us to augment human creativity, human hypothesis generation, the ability to generate hypotheses and to learn from examples by um, machine learning systems. And at the same time, in the laboratory world, um, the, the human can at least partially be augmented by robotic uh, synthesis and testing. And we've developed tools that support both parts, hypothesis generation and testing, deduction and induction, and even try, we even try to simulate this whole drug discovery cycle within one system uh, by using our software. And one of these software tools is TIGER, the target inference generator. Um, because the prediction of biological activity, as I outlined before taking the Voltaire example, um, is the most critical part uh, of this cycle. How to predict function from structure. So we have developed tools where you feed in just a two-dimensional structure of uh, a molecule of interest. Here, for example, the marketed drug celecoxib. It's known or it's annotated, had been annotated in literature as a selective COX-2, uh, cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitor, a painkiller, celecoxib. And um, we were interested, can we predict this target? Yes, we can. That's relatively straightforward. But which other targets can be predicted by a, such a machine learning system that was trained on known bioactive compounds? In this case, 650,000 structures of uh, bioactive compounds from the Campbell database. And here you see um, parts of the results. So our TIGER software predicted a total of 20 targets for celecoxib, we tested all of them in biological assays and found that roughly half of them, half of these predictions were correct. And now here you see uh, experimental results, um, uh, concentration uh, activity curves, and some of these targets, uh, correctly predicted targets are quite amazing. The Herg channel, uh, adren ad uh, adrenal receptors, the Rx scene re sex, uh, receptors, and a glucocorticoid receptor, all of which are off targets, which we wouldn't want to hit when we do drug discovery because they can lead to severe side effects. And indeed, for celecoxib, uh, the FDA had issued a warning uh, that might be related to exactly those predicted off targets. On average, um, we found that um, this, uh, these target predictions predict 11 off targets for marketed drugs. So now we have a system available uh, that very quickly and very swiftly and more or less reliably, um, say roughly 50% accuracy, every second target is correctly predicted, can predict targets for known drugs and molecules. It also works for natural products. And I'm a big fan of starting from nat with natural products for drug discovery because they have been evolved over millions of years to interact with proteins in the human body and have a very specific and selective function. For example, in an ingredient of grape, red wine, resveratrol, it's known to have cardiopreventive uh, uh, effects. We were interested, why is that? No one had an idea. And using this, this uh, prediction machine learning tool, um, we found estrogen receptor beta, as potently blocked by resveratrol. And this actually is known to be cardioprotective. It also works for more complex natural product structures. Here, this depsipeptide dolicolide, originating from the sea hair, actually um, microbes um, producing uh, this dolicolide. Here, this is, this is an anti-cancer compound. We identified the first known target 
namely uh, EP3 receptor. And this receptor controls actin filament movement. And if you block it, for example, with dolicolite, then rapidly dividing cancer cells cannot divide anymore. And it is has this molecule has anti-cancer activity. So having these and many other examples uh, available, we can now turn to the question, how do we generate new chemical structures that have a desired predicted activity? And here we also borrowed from DeepMind's earlier work, namely on AlphaGo, mimicking um, this this uh, this uh, this game AlphaGo, uh, or sorry, Go, the, the 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 game Go, and we converted this idea of a game, gamified, you can you could say, chemistry. In this diagram on the left, each little dot, rep, uh, dot represents um, a chemical molecule, a molecule, uh, a line represents a chemical transformation that is a chemical reaction. And the depth of the tree tells us how many consecutive chemical reactions uh, were performed uh, by, by use uh, of our software tools. So we start from, from a building block. You could start from an atom and then the system plays the what if game. What if I converted this building block, use it, I don't know, amide bond formation to form a virtual product. So we score the virtual product, compute some reward, then the system branches again. And by various smart uh, search uh, technologies, uh, we can search this space of up to 100, uh, sorry, sorry, 10 to the power of 30 potential virtual products and identify both suggested reaction paths and desired new molecules with, with predicted uh, desired activity using this kind of gamified uh, chemical design. Now here's an, one of these uh, applications. The goal was to mimic anglerine A, an anti-cancer uh, natural product from potato bush. It needs a 15 step chemical total synthesis to actually obtain anglerine A. So this is not sustainable uh, economically and ecologically uh, to use this natural product as a drug. And we were interested to design, to generate, automatically generate alternatives, mimetics thereof. First, we predicted again, um, the target panel of uh, this natural product. And we found among other uh, targets, um, the menthol um, receptor, transient receptor potential M8, a calcium channel, which is blocked by anglerine A. And on the right, you see the two top scoring designs generated by our de novo uh, structure generator, design one and design two. They look very different from anglerine A. So when asking chemists, uh, what do you think? Oh, I would never have thought about that. And this is how we see these de novo de design generators uh, actually uh, play uh, a seminal part in, in, in the chemist's creativity by acting as a colleague, um, a chemical colleague, a virtual chemist who makes suggestions which we hadn't thought about. In fact, these, these compounds could be synthesized as predicted by the software in only three steps, and they've inherited the activity, this uh, calcium channel blocking activity of the natural product. Another example, more recently, we looked at Merino Pyrrole. It is an anti-effective and anti-cancer compound, and we identified using target prediction, the first known um, target, and it's cyclooxygenase one. It's a relatively weak inhibitor. Then we used our de novo design tool, and you see the structure of the top scoring molecule that was generated by the computer um, here on the screen. It could be synthesized in three steps compared to nine step synthesis of Merino Pyrrol A. It is a selective and highly potent COX-1 inhibitor. It is the most selective uh, COX-1 inhibitor known to date. And it inherited seven out of known targets of, uh, sorry, predicted targets of Merino Pyrrol A. Now, linking uh, back to the uh, previous talk, uh, we then solved the crystal structure complex between the de novo designed compound and its target uh, cyclooxygenase one, also a first. And uh, this led, came up with some surprise. 
The de novo design compound here shown in magenta, in purple, binds in an opposite orientation than other known drugs, marketed drugs, uh, that, that block cyclooxygenase one. And interestingly enough, the de novo design compound um, is a selective inhibitor of this enzyme. Here, this is an example how machine learning and de novo design with machine intelligence actually helped identify a new space, a new idea how to develop selective uh, enzyme inhibitors here for the case of cyclooxygenase. And to uh, loop back to, to the cartoon representation I showed earlier uh, in my talk, uh, we've also made, uh, made the, uh, built a machine that uh, autonomously um, creates new ideas, which molecules to synthesize, synthesizes these molecules, uh, subjects them to, to uh, uh, an analysis and feeds back the results into the machine learning system. In this case, we used a chemical language model um, to, uh, to, to produce, uh, to generate candidate compounds. And then in order to facilitate synthesis, um, uh, a virtual retro synthesis filter was applied that let pass only those uh, de novo generated molecules that would, could be synthesized by one of or more of 17 allowed reactions, which we uh, implemented in a microfluidic uh, synthesizer. And this is actually a view of the chemistry lab of the future. It's very tiny. This replaces the round flask in the chemical lab uh, in which you can synthesize uh, new molecules in flow in continuous production. On the right hand side, this is an academic lab. This is uh, our lab uh, in, in Zurich. And it, this is an image, a photograph of the first prototype ever uh, of such an autonomous uh, miniaturized laboratory driven by machine intelligence. Now, Big Pharma has adapted, uh, sorry, adopted this technology and these ideas very swiftly. And there are whole labs now running autonomously and help us design and produce new chemicals. Finally, this whole idea can also be used uh, for peptide and protein design. And here is an example. Uh, we train these machine learning system with known peptide sequences, and then uh, sample new sequences. And here is an, an NMR structure, which we solved uh, of one of the uh, compounds. We were aiming here at finding anti-cancer peptides. And indeed, this compound selectively kills anti-cancer cells by destroying cancer cell membranes. Finally, um, small video. What you see here is a breast cancer cell, an MCF7 cell trapped in a microfluidic trap. And uh, it expresses a uh, fluorescent protein. And the peptides, when added to this cell, they, the peptides flow from left to right. You see that the membrane of this cell, this cancer cell, dissolves, it pops open, uh, it bursts. And in this way, um, these computer generated completely new sequences, uh, natural amino acids, but new uh, peptide sequences. Uh, can now be used uh, as tools uh, to selectively uh, kill cancer cells without affecting um, non-transformed human uh, healthy cells. All right, uh, with that, I come to an end. I hope you um, learned today that molecular design with machine intelligence works. It's a matured uh, technology you can use in your own laboratories. It creates uh, surprising solutions, and this is the the most important aspect, uh, I'd say. It helps us make better decisions faster. Uh, faster. And um, many of the computer generated designs have the desired activity with a success rate of somewhere between 50 and 80%. But again, AI is not a magic hammer. Uh, John mentioned it before, I'd like to reiterate here. Uh, always be critical and apply deep thinking together with deep learning to make sense of these computer generated products. Thanks very much. If you're interested to learn more about my phenomenal team who, who did all that and uh, also uh, want to down download a software and use it yourself, check out our website, ModLab, the Molecular Design Laboratory at ETH Zurich. Thank you very much, Gisbert. that was great. So uh, 
Last up, we have uh, Michaela van der Schaar, uh, who is a professor at uh, Cambridge University. And she will tell us about how AI is contributing to the next step uh, of drug, drug development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak. We have heard about some fantastic ways in which machine learning can enable us to design new drugs. But as Gisbert was saying, uh, are these drugs indeed going to be useful for a particular patient given their unique characteristics? Today, I'm going to talk about how machine learning can enable us to learn from observational data which drug is good for which type of patient given their characteristics. I'm going to, in view of time, just very briefly introduce some key ideas challenges and solutions. So the problem is easy. It's easy to pose, but not easy to solve. We would like ideally to identify what treatment or intervention is best for a particular individual that suffers from a particular disease. For instance, we have here a patient that was just diagnosed with breast cancer. And the question may be, should we give after surgery to this particular patient, chemotherapy or not? And if we do, what type of dosage and what type of compounds to use? At this stage, you may wonder whether randomized controlled trials, which are the golden standard, could be a solution to this problem. But as we know, treatment effects are often heterogeneous and they vary across the different patients. And in fact, randomized controlled trials are not able to solve this particular problem because they are small sample size. They are not representative in, the, in terms of the patients that they enrolled. Many of these patients may not be elderly or may not have the comorbidities like the representative patients do. Also, some medication may not work over time and one may need to change to other types of treatments over time. And they do not capture the complexity of care. And in some cases, they are even not possible to run due to ethical issues. So an alternative is to learn from observational data, which comes in forms of electronic health records, clinical registries, and other such sources of data. They are large sample size, and they do contain representative patients and they do capture many aspects of care. And if we would be able to do that, they will enable us to do inexpensive and fast understanding of which treatments would be best for a particular patient, given unique characteristics and unique healthcare situation they are going to be treated in. But of course, doing that is tricky because this requires estimating individualized rather than average treatment effects from observational bias data. And this is tricky because both of missing counterfactuals as well as confounding. So the type of problem we would like to solve is to learn from observational data that contains patient features, potentially patient features over time, treatment assignment, which is biased because it is based on actual clinical practice, as well as outcomes of patients over time. And in this case, of course, this is not a randomized controlled trial. The clinicians are not closing their eyes when assigning these treatments. So we need to learn in the presence of such biases. And we do not have counterfactuals. We do not know what would have happened if these patients would have been treated with another drug or would not have been treated at all? What would have happened if they were treated with another dose or at a later moment in time? And this is a very complicated machine learning problem. In fact, much more complicated than any translation problem or than playing games of Go. It's a very complicated causal effect inference problem. And again, we do not have labels. We only have labels for what we have done and what we have observed and not for the many other counterfactuals. 
So one can pose that as a causal inference problem where we are learning from observational data using machine learning. Machine learning can help in this situation in the following way. Uh, due to their flexibility, we are able to model in a very flexible way with a variety of architectures, the treatment assignment variable W. Also, we are able to deal with selection bias by crafting different types of losses to train various architectures. There has been tremendous progress in the last six years on this problem of learning individualized treatment effects from observational data. Early progress was around 2016 from MIT, and then you see a variety of works, and our own lab has done a significant amount of work to solve problems in binary treatment effects, multiple treatments, continuous treatments, such as dosage, treatment effects over time, and many other settings. If you want to learn uh, briefly about this topic, we recommend a tutorial which we have written for a clinical pharmacology and therapeutics journal recently. Also, we have a very um, diverse set of resources for anyone who is interested to learn about these cutting edge technologies. Please take a look. Today, I'm going to just very briefly show to you one particular example, which we developed with clinicians at the University of Amsterdam Medical Center, as well as in Cambridge, where the focus was to combine ideas from pharmacology with ideas from machine learning. And what we want to show to you here is that machine learning in joining forces with biology and pharmacology can be significantly empowered. The problem we wanted to address was the use of dexamethasone for COVID-19 patients in the ICU. And this is a very complicated problem because it requires managing the level of immune response, which is challenging because the right level of immune response varies across the patients. Because the immune response is not directly observable in clinical settings, clinicians often resolve to unspecified inflammatory markers, such as the C-reactive protein, or for short CRP. The PTT model of dexamethasone is actually very well understood by the pharmacologist. And better markers of immune response, such as cytokine type 1 interferons, can be measured, but they can be only measured in the laboratory setting. And they, can, they are included in the pharmacological model. However, they are not easily measured in the clinical setting, and therefore they are not available to the clinicians. So the question was, how can we use these powerful pharmacological models together with machine learning to empower clinicians? So we created a model, a machine learning model that enables us to bridge the gap between the research lab, the pharmacological lab, and the clinic. Pharmacological models describe the dynamics of these carefully medically chosen variables in the form of an ordinal differential equation. However, as I mentioned, these models describe a limited collection of expert variables, which I'm going to call physiological variables, which are not observed in clinical environments. And these pharmacological models are typically developed and calibrated in the laboratory, and they are not um, really based on expert variables which we can directly measure in the clinic. On the other hand, in clinical environments, the, physical, the physiological variables are frequently not observed. Instead, we observe clinical biomarkers and endpoints, and they are important for clinical decision-making, but they do not take these PKPD models, these valuable PKPD models, due to their high complexity and the unobservability of many of these parameters. So these two worlds of pharmacology and of clinical decision-making are often not interacting. Using machine learning, we are able to create this bridge between the research lab and the clinic. And we are doing that using a machine learning model that we have built that we call a latent hybridization model. 
And this embeds a given pharmacological model into a larger latent variable model, a system of neural ODEs. I'm showing here an example of one particular pharmacological model, but the reality is that you can use many others. And also while I'm showing here an example from pharmacology, you can also embed other settings, for instance, from physiology, from biology or epidemiology. So you can take an expert model that you have developed in the lab and embed it in a similar way in a machine learning model. Note that in this latent hybridization model, we are able now for the first time to use observational clinical data to learn both the evolution of the unobservable latent variables and the relationship between the measurements, the clinical measurements, and all the latent variables. And these latent variables include both expert variables from the pharmacological model, as well as other latent variables about the state of the patient, such as, for instance, their comorbidities or other physiological measurements. Note that the practical extensions of this latent hybridization model could include static covariates, thereby enabling personalization, and also we can model informatively sample data, which is very important in clinical settings because we do not have observations at all times. Finally, in the current work, we also assume that the pharmacological model may be incorrect in several ways. The obvious way in which this functional form of the pharmacological model may be wrong is that it's misspecified. For instance, it uses a linear model, while in, in effect, we may have a nonlinear model. And many existing techniques can address such misspecification, and they are integrated into this latent hybridization model. We are learning using a very elegant Bayesian variational inference model, the parameters of this latent hybridization model. Then um, we have used this uh, extensively together with clinicians in the University of Amsterdam uh, Hospital. And we have used a model to infer the expert variables for the immune response to viral infection as well as dexamethasone concentration, information that was not possible before, and then show to the clinicians how the pharmacological model actually um, results um, in the biomarkers that we expect to see in this particular patient, thereby enabling them to make better decisions. In addition, I want to show something else that is interesting. We know that machine learning models are usually not very smart. And if they have only limited data to learn from, which is often the case in medicine, unlike in the previous two examples where we have the advantage of many, many examples, in the clinical settings, we may have very few patients only from which we can learn from. In COVID, in the ICU initially, we had only very few patients. And machine learning models alone, for instance, very powerful machine learning models developed, for instance, for natural language processing or many other settings, were incapable to learn effectively when we had 100, 200, or even 1,000 patients. However, these models, which are learning not only on the basis of the available data, but also the um, knowledge of the pharmacologists, were able to learn much more effectively. What you see here is the precision accuracy um, associated with a variety of predictions and the lower the number, the better. And what you can see is that this latent hybridization model, which combines the uh, already available knowledge from pharmacology with the machine learning model information, this hybridization, these two significant performance improvements than conventional machine learning models alone or expert models alone. Finally, um, I'm presenting here just very, very little of what can be done using this type of models. If you are interested to learn more about machine learning and what it can do in healthcare, we have an engagement session that we call Inspiration Exchange, 
where we are trying to join forces with machine learners interested in healthcare from around the globe. And we have a next session on September 19 at 4 p.m. UK. So if you want to hear more and delve further into this type of methods, please join us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, John, Gisbert, and Michaela. That was, that was great. So we now have a, a short panel discussion. For those joining us, you know, if you have any questions to any of the three speakers, please type them in, in the Q&A uh, box. If you could indicate who the question is for, that would be useful too. And then uh, after this panel discussion, we'll go through uh, some of those. So uh, John Gisbert and Michaela, I, I suspect many of the people who've joined us today are actually experimentalists. You know, they might work in a lab studying proteins or cells. They might uh, design drugs, or perhaps some of them are even involved in, in clinical decisions like Michaela spoke about. So um, I guess many of them are wondering, you know, where does this now all go? You know, will artificial intelligence replace our experiments or even worse, will they uh, replace us? So I thought we could we could start by um, by that question. Perhaps we will go from John to Gisbert and Michaela, get your first opinions on that question. I, I don't see it. Okay, you know, I, I work at a company whose goal is to develop artificial general intelligence, but we're not there yet, right? A system that's really, you know, thinking and planning and making decisions at, with uh, human level intelligence, but we're not we're not there at that moment. So we'll, we'll set aside replacing them. I think there is an interesting question of replacing experiment, and I think there's definitely definitely no way it replaces all experiment. As with any uh, any computational tool, you hope it. I, the way I define myself as a as like a computational biologist is what does success look like? Success look is when experimentalists look at the outputs and do a better experiment because of it. And I think really, I think there is some, there will be some times when you can look at an alpha fold structure and skip experimental structure determination or have more confidence in the relationship of say crystallographic conditions to cellular conditions. But I think quite a lot of it is all enabling us to kind of go after this business of understanding the cell. And I, and I really see it as experimentalists being the expert in what they do next. And I always look at like the alpha fold work is you can have this answer in an hour or so, or if it's in the database in 10 seconds, and then you can use that to plan your experiment. You can use that to do functional studies instead. Um, you can feed it into larger systems, but I think we'll do all these things. And I'm most concerned that we do them um, in proportion to say the, the reliability of the machine and in understanding really what's predicted, what's not. And then, and then experimentalists are really all the time behave on, you know, work with uncertainty, work with, you know, not being sure what the experiments mean and everything else. And I think it's the normal case of things and it's the exciting part of science. Elizabeth, oh. what do you think from the chemist point of view? Well said, John, hard to follow here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say uh, AI tools today already, um, can help us reduce um, experimental work to those experiment and provide us with time to focus on those experiments that are challenging, that are fun, that demand human thinking. So the, 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 the natural intelligence, uh, for example, uh, when, when, when talking about automating drug discovery, automating the laboratory, um, my point of view is that we should automate whatever we can automate uh, and in order to to make use to 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 best use a, a human's capability because our capability is our brain is not made uh, to um, sift through millions of chemical structures after well 10 20 30 at most we have forgotten the first two we had we had a look at um, so here I see um, the, the future of also in, in chem chemical education that uh, we will have, uh, we, we need to adapt our curricula, uh, our syllabus to, um, to include AI and machine learning uh, so that, and this was also a question in, in the chat, um, 
so that the future generation of, of chemists is equipped with this knowledge and can think of the AI uh, as a colleague in the lab. Cool. Thank you. That that kind of resonates with Michaela, one of Michaela's last slides, which has this open session for everyone interested. I think that was really cool. Michaela, would you like to add? Yes. So uh, while my two colleagues here are focusing, of course, on empowering and possibly replacing chemists, in my case, there is absolutely no question that we are not going to replace the clinicians. That's not a focus at all. The focus in our case is to really empower the clinicians to make judgments and be able to help the patients in front of them. As a matter of fact, as we are discovering more and more drugs and better and better drugs, and that's wonderful, we are also going to have a much more complex task of deciding which drugs, what to give, when to give, when not to give a drug, when to stop a drug and change to another drug, as different types of morbidities and comorbidities are evolving. So that is a tremendously complex task. And it is one where we need tools not to replace the clinicians, which we will never be able to do, but to provide them with information and knowledge as to what seems to work best for the type of patient in front of them and provide them with information and certainty estimates associated with them, but also present them with uh, different types of um, information about side effects, competing risks associated with these treatments, because it is not only about the effect of a drug, but also the effect of this drug on other morbidities and comorbidities. And all of this needs to be studied and it cannot be studied on the basis of a clinical trial. It needs to be studied on the basis of a post-marketing analysis of these numerous drugs. And for that machine learning can help empower the clinician, but in the end is the clinician and the patient together that need to make the decision. And finally, there is the human touch that the clinician always has, which really um, will never, I never believe this will be uh, taken over by a machine because it is really um, almost like a supernatural sense of understanding the patient and understanding symptoms of the patient, which I never think that any general machine intelligence will ever, it's about the EQ, which is very much playing a role in how the patient will look like. And, and as I conveyed, I really don't believe that it is machine learning alone. Even then, it is machine learning together with biological knowledge and chemical knowledge, which together can help put this puzzle together. Yes, thank you, Michaela. It sounds like empowering is, is the commonality between the three answers right it, nobody replace you know it's not that ai will replace the humans they will uh, they will empower them so john briefly touched on you know how confident does the ai itself think in in its that its prediction is right because as as experimentalists if we're going to be empowered by these methods then we need to kind of know how much can we trust them right so John touched upon that. So I was wondering whether Michaela and, and, and Gisbert perhaps have some, some ideas in that too. Of course, drugs will always be tried in, in tests and clinical trials, but you know, how, how much can we trust what the, what the um, AI tells us? I uh, completely agree with John uh, on this point. I think uncertainty estimation and really frequent guarantees are extremely important for everything I do. I do a lot of work on building not only analytical models, but also uncertainty estimation associated with these models, because we need to know and tell the clinician and the patient when we know and when we do not know. So I think that one of the most important parts and components of machine learning for healthcare in, in my setting, where the focus is empowering clinicians, is to provide these models, not only with interpretability, but maybe even more important, with confidence guarantees associated with it. 
such that the clinicians know when these models are not confident in the predictions they are making for the class of patients in front of them. So I think that's vital, but complicated. <laughs> Jesper, would you have 100% some... agreed. Um, I'm not sure to which degree we will ever be able to interpret or understand these machine learning models, the complex machine learning models you spoke about, latent spaces and, and such, um, in, in terms of the language we've, we're using and we've learned uh, to express uh, natural phenomena language of chemistry, language of medicine, language of biology. So here I see li clear limitations of uh, the understandability uh, or interpretability of machine learning models. Um, the, the aspect of confidence, um, uh, this is absolutely mandatory to, uh, I think there shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't be any uh, machine learning model without um, uh, uh, indications to, towards the uh, domain of applicability. So these can be con confidence uh, estimations. These can be obtained by, uh, by experiments. So we typically uh, synthesize and test these molecules uh, suggested by the computer. And once we have done this 50, 60 times, then we have an approximate idea uh, to which degree it works and uh, to which degree it doesn't. And this also uh, goes back to the previous questions. Here we need... Uh, real experimentalists to do the legwork. Cool, John. I think uh, two, two points to make to this that I think are kind of interesting. One is I think it, when we talk about interpretability and really talking about, in a sense, second guessing, like I don't believe that's a good explanation is often what we're looking for out of interpretability. And it can be useful, but I think it is not as important as model as we should own our own confidence in this as developers of machine learning tools that when we say we're right, we should be right. I think there is also people overestimate the interpretability of experimental biology. No one, uh, no one will, will say, I don't want that crystal structure because you can't explain to me why you needed those crystallization conditions because it's been well characterized as a procedure that when you follow, this is its reliability and this is the places where it's unreliable, for example, around crystal contacts. And I think there's this social aspect of the community and the post-market analysis of computational tools in terms of you know all the papers on when can we trust them under what conditions. And one of the things I'll say is that this is a place where the community, I think CASP really sets the gold standard in, in uh, clinical trials for uh, computational tools. And the community could, I think, even do more to do very, very careful measurements because you don't want to be in the condition of I tried it once and it didn't work, therefore it doesn't work for this class. You really want to think about how do we build in these things that help us understand in more and more areas, when are they reliable, in what ways are they reliable. And I think as we get more computational tools uh, that start to really impact the experiments people do, this is going to become incredibly important how we think about understanding their performance. Michaela? Sorry to jump in again. Um, John put me to think, and I want to make two points here. One of them is, of course, the type of uh, methods I'm talking about are quite different than what John and Gisbert have talked about. And one of the challenge for, for us is extremely challenging because we do not want only uncertainty estimation for predictions, for which we know a lot. And my lab and many others have done work in that area. What's even trickier for us is we need for counterfactuals uncertainty estimation as well. And dealing with all the biases that we have and the fact that we not always observe these counterfactuals makes the problem of confidence estimation even trickier, but it doesn't mean that we and others have not made progress in that area. I'm just saying that this is challenging methodologically as well. And finally, uh, while I completely agree with what John and Gisbert said, for the chemical structure, I think that it's more important to be right than to be interpretable. In our case, because we are very much building these tools, not for chemists, not for the pharma pharmacists, but rather for the clinicians and patients, these tools need to be understandable and it need to be debuggable and, and um, very carefully considering the people using them. This is useful for them to integrate them in their ecosystem. So I think for us, interpretability is key and even more so than if you just discover drugs 
because we really need to inform the decision makers and they need to understand the basis on which these particular predictions and decisions are made. Very good. Jesper, do you want to com comment on that? Um, what did I want to say? <laughs> Sorry. You did put your hand up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Off, uh, I'm just off, uh, off track right now. Sorry for that. It's too late here. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Uh, perhaps you know we can we can start moving this to the uh, Q and A session. And I, I was struck by one question actually already by uh, Manasa Desai, and I think it would be valuable to hear an answer from all three of you. She asked, you know, if if I'm a beginner, I just finished the master, how do you go about learning all this? You know, it is what what would be a good way? What would you recommend people interested in machine learning? And, and you know, they all come from their each respective fields, but what, what could they do to get into this? Who would like to go first on that? I'm talkative. Um, I I think there's 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 two paths here, and I think there's two ways to get into this. Um, I think one is from, let's say, the, the computationalist machine learning methods developer side and one from the user biologist side. Now, I'll start kind of maybe from the user side. The most important thing is to use it widely. You don't want the very first time you use a computational tool to be on anger on a problem where you really need to be right. You want, the, you want to try it on many problems where you know the answer, some that you think are as hard maybe as the problem you're studying. Like, Think of these in some ways as black boxes, a productive way, or as a new experimental tool where you characterize its behavior by trying it. And I think as users, like really understanding these tools, understanding them on known problems is certainly how we work with them. And I think how users can build their intuition. I think this is one of the really important roles of something like the AlphaFold database is that everyone got to see it on lots of structures where they knew the answer, they had an understanding of the system. And so that helped the community build a collective intuition about when and how this was reliable or not. I think from the kind of computationalist side, read papers. I mean, that's kind of how I got into it is I, I kind of saw there was this cool area coming up. And so I read everything I could get my hands on. And I think we we kind of underestimate how much just digging in and and going about this will let you develop ideas and then you can try them and play with them and develop intuition. And it's like, it's like how you learn like math or physics in good classes. You you learn it by doing the homework. The lecture isn't where you learn it, right? Don't listen to us. Go try and fit models and you'll figure out quickly how these kind of things work and, and play and do. And that's the that's my advice. Cool. Let Thanks, me Joe. jump in as the academic then, Shores. I would say if you are interested to learn more about that, come to Cambridge, uh -huh. where we have this wonderful Cambridge Center for AI and Medicine where we have clinicians, we have biologists, we have machine learners like me working together, trying to really teach uh, the young generation before they go and work for DeepMind or for other companies, um, they, they come and learn in this multidisciplinary ecosystem. So I would say, find a place where you have the ability to learn from many disciplines and having this interdisciplinary approach. As a matter of fact, as we speak in Cambridge, this center that I'm directing, the Cambridge Center for Iron Medicine, is running a summer school that is aimed at both industry as well as students aiming at learning more about this topic. So I think that there is a tremendous opportunity nowadays, unlike in my time, to be in this interdisciplinary academic environment to learn from these different fields. And I think that that's the future, rather than be a monolithic person learning just biology, medicine, or machine learning. Cool. It's been 100 percent agreed. Um, I second every statement made. I mean, there are uh, already a number of, of these chemoinformatics or AI summer school e or winter school events uh, participate in those. Uh, um workshops and and uh do the online tutorials there they are they are popping up everywhere right now at eth as well like in uh, cambridge we have uh, an ai center that is interdisciplinary even transdisciplinary and um maybe one final statement uh, along these lines i would i would suggest uh you you go where your 
desire, where your curiosity, where your heart takes you, rather than forcing yourself uh, with the impression, I must learn this or that, but I don't want to. No, as, as John said, uh, be, be playful, <laughs> play, play, play with, with tools, but you, you certainly need uh, to be able um, to, to, uh, to understand and, and, and write in, in a scripting language uh, as a natural scientist. For example, Python would be a good entry point here. Thanks, Gisbert. You want to comment on that, John? Or? Or it kind of made me think about one other thing, which is maybe my one, my one controversial opinion is don't just go to the interdisciplinary places. I think you will get, if you want to learn machine learning for biology, you're, you're, you're better off sequentially going to the best biology place you can in the world and then the best machine learning place that you can find in the world, right? Go to the, go learn the machine learners worldview from the very best machine learners, go learn the biologist worldview from the very best biologists and build the synthesis and understand how people have built the synthesis. But so I think one of the challenges of interdisciplinary work is you really have to integrate both worldviews 100%. And so my slightly controversial opinion is make sure you're not only working at the intersection, otherwise you can build the wrong system to solve a non-problem, for example, or not understand like the worldview and technologies of machine learning and how to bring them in a novel way to these systems. So that's my controversial Wait, opinion. I need to disagree with John about that. <laughs> so definitely I will agree with him that you need to be in the best possible place. But let's be honest, a variety, so definitely the best place is often have both the best in machine learning as well as the best in biology or best medicine. But the reality is that, for instance, in my area, machine learning for healthcare, there are many machine learners that have a tool. They have understood a tool and they beat everything with that particular one tool without the imagination and the need to model correctly complex world of, for instance, medicine. I do not know much about chemistry, but John, if you allow me, in the area of medicine, it is very complicated to come up with complex models. And yet, for instance, what we have been showing in our lab over the years is that we are able to have a substantial number of papers in the best machine learning conferences where pure machine learning is, um, let's say, the pure machine learners are competing for, and yet be mindful of the complex world of medicine. And that cannot be learned easily in a lab just learns and teaches machine learning for, I don't know, uh, having cats and dogs, but one needs to understand the complex world of medicine. I guess we need to get dinner and, and discuss this over. <laughs> yes, I can, I can add from my own experiment because we've been dabbling with, with, dabbling with machine learning too, that it is, it is, different languages that the different fields often speak and it is being able to speak to each other with experts from the different fields and building bridges between them that that is often the the problem there okay given the amount of time i thought i'd briefly select one or two questions for each of you specifically about your talk and then uh, see how that goes so uh gisbert uh, chiara rapisarda asks whether your your molecules to do this, the, the prediction of, of uh, functionality, do they do this de novo just from the drug or do they need the knowledge of the binding site of the drug in order to make these predictions? In fact, uh, in fact uh, today I only presented ligand-based design approaches. So we, we play ignorant uh, regarding the, the, the protein site, the receptor binding site. Everything I presented was done without any knowledge of the uh, cognate protein. But of course, um, the, the other part of the design world, drug design world, namely the structure-based design world, and uh, this cer certainly uh, uh, place to, to, to alpha fold, for, for example, um, uh, is a very active field of research. We and others have developed such technology, uh, but there, to the best of my knowledge, there is maybe one paper out or coming out uh, that that does this uh, in a in a generative way from binding pocket to ligand. Uh, we are currently synthesizing and testing such compounds, and once done, uh, we'll publish. Exciting! Thank you, uh, John. Um... Krishna was wondering about uh, uh, plant, pr plant proteins. So they mentioned that plant proteins are somewhat underrepresented in the PDB. So they were wondering, you know, does 
does alpha fold do well on, on plant proteins or, or is that a problem? To my knowledge, yes. I think the, the general evidence has been confidence is high, confidence is still reliable among plant proteins in general. I mean, always look at the confidence. I will say sequencing could, sequencing coverage may differ. One of the things to say is that alpha fold really doesn't, so you would, you would need like weird evolutionary patterns might throw off. I can see that in viruses maybe, but I wouldn't expect it in plant protein. So, but I'll, I'll say, I'll say also there are plant protein structures. There are ones after our training cutoff. So the very best way to answer that is to look at the plant proteins that are available. And the good thing about evaluating machine learning is you can do it on 20 examples. You don't need a thousand. Mm -hmm. And there are probably certainly 20 examples in the last couple of years that you could use. Cool. Um, Michaela then Jack uh, asks about the role of the knowledge from longitudinal studies. You know, is that type of knowledge being part of the uh, machine learning approach? Very much so. So thank you for this question. So um, as one of my clinical collaborators is saying, medicine is a, the, the, the art of medicine is about understanding the time series, the longitudinal pathway of the patient, how the patient got to a particular stage of disease, what types of morbidities and comorbidities have developed, how do they respond to drugs? So lo looking longitudinally at the trajectory of disease with and without interventions such as treatments definitely is part of what we are doing. And this is, again, I'm going to advertise this September 19th at 4 p.m. engagement session where we are talking exactly about longitudinal trajectories of disease. Cool. Join us. <laughs> Thanks. Uh Perhaps another one uh, for Gisbert, this one from Lou Sheffer. Uh, uh, and they ask, has there been a systematic effort to identify all targets of known approved drugs? Because that might help in finding useful side effects of already approved drugs. Very good point. Very good question. Love it. Um, this has been done uh, using our tools and other tools that are around, uh, uh, I think, almost Every pharma company has done this and many academic groups as well. And repurposing uh, of, um, of, of known drugs for other indications, for other treatments, and systematically predicting potential side effects, undesired effects uh, of drugs. This has been done very successfully uh, using these uh, prediction tools. Cool. Thank you. Uh, John, then I have one more for... Um... For you, uh, Zhao Ming Zhu asks, what's your perspective on RNA structure prediction? I guess you get that one quite often. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a very interesting problem. So we've seen some recent work on it by at least two labs. I know Jeng Lab has put out one with a, with a, uses a lot of the ideas from AlphaFold. And there's another one, and I apologize, I can't remember it. Uh, I think what is Almost certainly true is that the kind of ideas in AlphaFold will improve RNA structure prediction. The absolute level that we'll get to with those and other ideas, I think is still an open question that a lot of labs are working on. I know also some RNA structures were present in this round of CASP where we'll get results in December. So I, I expect, what I think is very certain is that we will get some rapid progress on it. And I think the absolute level that we will top out at, and obviously the, there's very few RNA structures, only a couple thousand in PDB and something like half are ribosomal proteins. So I think the, uh, the question of what will be the absolute level will just have to be answered empirically and carefully and where, where these systems will be reliable. But I have no doubt we'll see some progress and probably much more progress in the future as people like Shores help drive cryo-EM for RNA structure. And I'm sure we'll see more data and thus more machine learning advances in this amplification sort of way. Cool. And then perhaps one last one for, for Michaela. This one is from Nick Vangos. How do you plan on testing your models when they are intrinsically tied to real people and their experiences after clinical treatment? It seems like model validation is exceptionally difficult. So um, definitely, um, this is an important challenge. The fact that different patients may have different responses to different types of treatments and they may internalize actually differently. So some people may not want to have certain side effects. 
depending, maybe even some elderly may not want to be treated if the side effects are of a certain type. All of that plays an important role and is something that's complicated, but it's something that we are looking at together with clinicians. And in terms of methodology, just very recently in the last AAAI, so which is one of our main conferences, AI conferences, we have published a paper exactly about this topic of how to deal with um, multi-objective um, preference function of patients and how to possibly infer those from observational data and how to build recommender systems for patients to be able to decide together with their clinicians what would be best for them. So complicated, but we are making progress on it. Cool. Thank you very much. I think in the interest of time, we'll leave it for that for the Q&A. Um, Janine, shall I hand back over to you? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I just want to um, extend a big thanks to you, Shores, and of course to John Gilbert and Mihaela for a really great session today. The talks were fantastic and the discussion was also really awesome. Um, also a big thank you to our audience for joining us as always. Um, you can find a recording of today's event and all of our other events on the life science across the globe.org website and also on Janelia's YouTube channel. Um, they'll be available in the next day or two. Um, I also encourage all of you on the call to please take a moment and complete the brief survey that I linked in the chat box. We love to hear your feedback on the specific events and on the series overall. And we also give you an opportunity to give us some ideas of uh, topics that you would like to see in future life science across the globe events. So just as a reminder, we have two events left this year with the next one taking place on October 6th which is a Thursday instead of a Wednesday. Uh, it'll be hosted by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories and it focuses on brain body physiology. So please join us for that. 